thank you for, for coming. Um, welcome to my talk uh, that's titled, Is the Pen Mightier Than the Sword? Uh, basically, this will be a first look into the security of the Apple Pencil, because of pen, and the Apple Smart Keyboard, because before I did this research, I thought well, they're likely very similar. Um, in some regards, they are, but we will see this. Uh, so, who am I? I'm, I'm Stefan. I'm from Germany. I do this whole security things for 30 years now. Uh, I started with doing runtime encryption, then I moved over to exploitation. Um, then I moved over in this whole web security and PHP, and then I got so bored that in 2010 I thought I need a real target, so I went into the field of iOS security. Okay. So, um, the motivation of this talk is, uh, well, one thing is not in the slide, but uh, I was actually quite annoyed when I, uh, after a year of buying it, I took out an Apple Pencil and connected it to my, uh, to my uh, iPad, and it didn't work anymore. Uh, I later learned it's a broken battery, so I cannot do anything, but I wanted to know how this whole thing works, and that's why I started the research. Uh, but also there are a bunch of security aspects when you look at the uh, accessories that you can buy for, uh, for iPads. Uh, a lot of people use these Apple Pencils and these Smart Keepers, and they don't actually think about that this is like a computer. And they connect it to their, uh, to their iPad, and they just use it. And unlike the normal iOS system, there is actually no public research on the security of these accessories at all. At least I don't know any of it. So um, the next thing is these accessories look all the same. So you will never notice if someone just replaces your Apple Pencil. Uh, you will likely also not notice when someone just replaces your, your keyboard. And that's, that's clack, clack, and they have replaced your keyboard. Uh, so the question is, how much can we actually trust these devices? And uh, then the next thing is, even if nobody replaces it, uh, if someone asks you in a, in a Starbucks, oh, can, you, can I have your Apple Pencil for a second? I need to draw something. Maybe you give it away uh, because you don't see that it's a security threat. Uh, and in the end, what's a better keylogger than a keyboard? Um, so, and yes, of course, can a, can a malicious accessory take over your iPad? These are all the questions that I wanted to an answer. So disclaimer, um, this was announced as an introductory talk because it was an introduction. For me, it was also an introduction to this whole field, and I needed to know how all of this works and how I can start real juicy research in it. Um, I will likely do more, more talks in the future if I find some interesting thing, um, but today I want to give you the groundwork so that you can start your own research. I also so far did not harm any device. What I mean by this is I did not attempt any hardware attack. Uh, so I didn't try to break them open and uh, modify the chips uh, directly. But this is something I will also look into with help of some hardware security people. So uh, this talk is kind of open source uh, because I will use a few scripts and demos inside this uh, talk. And all of this will be available on this GitHub. Uh, so far, I've only created this and uploaded like a, a, an IDA file loader, but the other stuff will come within the next few days. Also, a white paper and the slide deck is on the uh, website from, uh, from Hack in the Box. Okay, so how do we start this research? Um, the easiest way is to find out what's inside. But as I said, I didn't harm anything, so I just looked it up on the internet. And there's iFixit, who actually did a teardown of this Apple smart keyboard in, I think, 2015. Um, and what they did is they found inside that there is an STM32F103VB a microcontroller in there. And since then, Apple has released this uh, smart keyboard in three different form factors. 12.9 inch, 10.5, and 9.7. Uh, the issue here is that the iFixit teardown 
is only for the very first one. So in theory, it's actually not known if the other two revisions have the same uh, microcontroller inside. Uh, the 9.7 seems to, because the firmware is very similar, but the 10.5 might be a completely new revision with a new microcontroller. Uh, the great thing about these STM microcontrollers is that for each of these, you just Google them and you find the product URL and the data sheet, and then you get tons and tons of information about them. Um, this one here, for example, is a mainstream performance line a microcontroller, which basically is an ARM Cortex M3. It has 128 kilobytes of flash memory, 20 megabyte, uh, 20 kilobytes of SRAM, and according to the data sheet, it has no memory protection unit. This means there can actually no real protection on the memory. The pencil was also uh, teared down by, by iFixit, and they discovered that there's an STML151UCY6 microcontroller in there, which is the red part here. And uh, this is a slightly different one. But again, we can just Google this and we will find the product URL and the data sheet. And from the data sheet, it says it's an ultra low power. It's also on Cortex M3. It has uh, 256 kilobytes of flash. It has 32 kilobytes of SRAM. It has eight kilobytes of data EEPROM. And the nice thing here is it actually has an MPU, so it can use memory protection features like non-writable and, and so on memory. Uh, also, it has uh, memory option bytes so that the flash can be configured so that certain areas of the memory are not uh, readable. So as I said, these STM microcontrollers are very nice uh, because they are very, very well documented. You can just Google them and you get to this product URL. And then at the end of this uh, website, you will find a large table of many, many documents about this specific uh, microcontroller or the family. So you will find programming guides, you will find, of course, the data sheet and everything. And inside this is everything you need to know to understand how they work. For example, this here is from the smart keyboard from the data sheet. It shows you the memory map of this uh, microcontroller. And you can see here for each peripheral uh, what the address is. And then in the other documents, you can find what registers at what offset and how, how do they work, what bit means what. And uh, so it's very nice, especially if you have never done anything with these kind of things like, like me before. So uh, the memory protection unit here, which is basically the thing that can give your memory different protection levels, uh, the lack of this is actually the first, in my point of view, little security weakness, because it means if you find a vulnerability, uh, the exploitation is likely very easy because there is no memory protection. Uh, the Apple Pencil, you must know, it actually has this MPU inside the, uh, the Cortex, uh, but from looking at the firmware, I did not find any... Um, yeah, usage or configuration of this MPU. So it's either not used at the moment, or there's an unknown boot ROM that runs before the firmware, and that might configure the MPU. But this is unknown, because it's not extracted yet. So the next thing is when you know what's inside, you want to know what, what is actually running on it. So you normally want to have the firmware. So uh, the nice thing about the pencil and the smart keyboard is they both allow firmware upgrades. Uh, actually, the firmware is automatically upgraded when they are connected to your iPad. And the upgrade is even silent. So you don't see that the upgrade happens. It just doesn't ask you. It just does it. Um, which was surprising to me because on the internet you can find some um, some pictures where actually there's a pop-up asking you if you want to upgrade some firmware, 
But in reality, uh, these updates s happen silently. At least those that I could witness. Uh, the user is absolutely not involved in this UTA process, and that means you cannot just like download from an Apple website this uh, this firmware binary and uh, look at it. So if you want to get the copy of the firmware, you actually need to follow the whole automatic upgrade path and find out where the update is. So who is actually capable of updating? So there's this thing that is the launch daemon called Com Apple Mobile Accessory Updater. And that launch daemon st starts the FAT daemon. Uh, inside this daemon, it's never said what actually FAT stands for, but it's likely firmware update daemon. Um, so this daemon, for some reason, runs as root. And I cannot witness that it runs in any sandbox. So this means this will update your devices, your accessories, talk to your accessories, uh, run as root, and is not inside a sandbox. This is another thing that I would consider a little security weakness. So this daemon uses a private framework that's called Mobile Accessory, Accessory Updater Framework. And this one uses different bundle plugins depending on what kind of device you have and what needs to be updated. So uh, in our case, um, this pencil and this keyboard is controlled via the standalone hit FUD plugins. And uh, when you look at it, and also from the name, you can see in the code that it's actually creating hit device connections to some drivers, and then uses them, sends hit feature requests, and uses them to uh, perform actually the, the upgrade. So how does upgrade discovery work? Um, the, this whole thing starts with the iPad downloading a manifest that contains information about the updates. So you can see these crazy long URLs that are kind of hard-coded. And uh, in the background, it will try to retrieve these URLs, which are basically XML files. So the Apple Pencil and the Smart Keyboard 12.9 have like a well-defined URL, and when you click it, you actually get some XML back. Um, the other smart keyboards, the two small ones, they theoretically also have URLs, but when you try to um, yeah, open them, you will see that the smart keyboard 9.7 will actually tell you, oh, there's no, no upgrade here. There's no firmware upgrade. There's nothing here. And the 10.5 is even worse. It will give you an access denied error. So there's nothing there. And this is a problem when you do the research, uh, because you only get an update for the 12.9. There's no public firmware for the other two smart keyboards. So when you look into this manifest, it's like an XML that does the usual description of all the content. And basically, it tells you what is the version that is available at the moment, how it is packed. Normally, that is zip. Uh, then later in this uh, XML, it will actually tell you where exactly you can download it and how big it is. And it also has a SHA-1 of the uh, downloadable file, so you can verify it. And then the whole thing is theoretically signed with some Apple-specific XML uh, signing. So you see in the end there's a certificate and a signature. And the certificate it uses, it's called the Asset Manifest Signing Certificate. So when you take the certificate and use OpenSSL to make it human-readable, you will get this kind of dump. And it's kind of interesting that uh, this certificate is expired. Uh, it expired like last month, 
in the middle of last month on 14th of July. And since then, I've tested it every day. Since then, Apple has not fixed that. Um, however, for me at the moment, it's an, a miracle what this actually has an impact. Because, as I said, there are still silent firmware updates happening, and they happen beside that this year is not working. So it's not really clear uh, why this still works, and I haven't actually tested this um, if it will also update on a very fresh restored uh, um, device. Maybe a device that was restored after this date doesn't have it cached yet, and then maybe uh, this will have an impact. Uh, but what you meet, need to know is that the last uh, updates from Apple were only posted in 2017 anyway. So there's a high chance when you have an, uh, any of these devices that you're running the latest firmware. Okay, so now we know where we find these XML files, where we can download the zip files. And now we need to know what's actually inside this zip file. Well, we, I will not bother to show you the directory structure. We are only interested in the fact that there's a, a firmware file inside. And for the pencil and for the keyboard, this is an AFU file, which is likely accessor, accessory firmware update. Uh, again, this is nowhere actually really documented. Uh, the file extension is not necessarily AFU in this file. It can be .bin, .anything. And um, I think the keyboard, for example, has .bin and the pencil has .afu. Uh, those two accessories are not the only ones using this file format. Uh, for example, the smart remote, no, I think it's called Ziri remote, uh, sorry. Uh, so the Ziri remote uses the same uh, uh, file format. But, for example, the airports have a completely different file format. Yes. Mm. In general, the file format looks like this. We have a 128 bytes header. Um, that header is followed by the actual firmware data. Then we have, at the moment, a SHA-256 hash of the data and the header. Um, and then, in the very end, we have a signature over this uh, SHA-256 hash. Uh, the signature is actually PKS uh, padded, so um, it's a secure way to do a signature. So, uh, the header, when we look inside, consists of three parts. It has a main header that specifies what kind of firmware this is, what device is it for, what hardware revision it for. Uh, it has a CRC over the firmware data, and of course, the length of the firmware data. Uh, when you see CRC anywhere in this accessory research, you must know that there are two different CRC algorithms that are used. Uh, there's, on the one hand, the normal CRC32, and then some STM uh, microcontrollers have an own CRC uh, engine inside that has, has a different configuration and therefore by default spits out a different CRC value. So some uh, accessories use the standard CRC32 and some use the STM32. Um, so this, the blue part is basically mandatory. Now, the red part is theoretically optional, but you will never see a firmware without this red part. So, um, the red part is this signature header, and that describes uh, where this SHA-256 hash is. Actually, theoretically, it also defines what kind of hash it is, but at the moment, there's only one supported. And it defines where the signature is and what kind of signature it is and how long the signature is. Um, there are actually different kind of signatures available. You have uh, signatures that are for all people, like anybody who downloads it. But Apple also supports a different kind of signature that is signed with a different key. And then um, this is supposedly personalized for your uh, device. 
So what that means is, if it's a personalized firmware, then the green header needs to be filled out. And the green header basically just has a unique ID in there that comes from your device. This means Apple can create you, uh, uh, can create a firmware for you that only works on one specific, uh, keyboard. And the way this works is that the STM, uh, microcontroller has a 12 byte or 96 bit internal unique ID. And this must match here. Then, uh, it's personalized for this specific device. Uh, I've never seen such a firmware in reality. I, I can only reverse it from the code. Um, speaking of code, uh, I've created two tools here. Both are Python scripts. The first one is a tool that takes an IFU file and does all the verifications, like it will check the CRC, will detect what de device it, it will auto, auto, auto use the right CRC algorithm, it will see the digest, will check the digest, it will see the RSA signature, will then uh, do the RSA check and will see that if it's correctly signed or not. So this tool helps you to see if your file is actually valid and should be accepted by the device. Uh, the next thing is, is an, uh, IDA Python file system plugin, uh, file, uh, format plugin. So if you want to do the research yourself, uh, you can use this so that your IDA understands this whole file format. Okay. So, uh, let's look at the actual firmware for a bit. So the Apple Pencil, at the moment, the current version is 2.4.8. Uh, in the GUI, it's shown as 2.48. Um, in the binary, it's just uh, hex 2.4.8. Uh, this one is available as OTA update. That means you can get access to this file just by downloading it, the, this upload path that I showed earlier. Uh, it's 183 kilobyte in size. And it's loaded at this uh, load address. Um, and you can see here that this is likely not the beginning of the address space. And um, this likely means that there is some part that cannot be upgraded that is inside this uh, device that we don't know about yet. There are 1,200 functions inside this when you open it in IDA and maybe beautify it a little bit. And it has 210 strings. Um, when you look at the smart keyboard firmware, then each different form factor has a different current uh, firmware. And there's only one uh, OTR update available at the moment for the 12.9. And that is the firmware 850 hex. The thing here is that when you buy a new uh, smart keyboard, you will actually get a completely different firmware that is 855. So when you buy it, it's actually newer than the newest update. So Apple does not give you the newest update. Uh, as you can see, the size of the firmware is like 45 kilobyte or 46, which is like way smaller than the pencil. And uh, therefore, it's easier to actually understand. But still, it has like 590 functions. But in the whole firmware, there are only six strings. So it's a lot harder to understand with no, no, no information. So the, uh, as I said earlier, both of these uh, f uh, firmwares are not loaded at the beginning of the memory map. So there's likely some code in front of it that we cannot upgrade, that does not come from the firmware, and that we at the moment have not extracted yet. Maybe it's not possible without a hardware attack. So um, let's dig a little bit deeper into the Apple Pencil. I already said the Apple Pencil has way more strings. And this is why a large uh, part of it is easier to understand because you have more strings that uh, give you hints. 
some of these strings are file names, and from those we know that they have something internally that is an RT6, uh, RTXC, which is a real-time operating system, but it's actually not clear what brand it is. It is, doesn't seem to be one of the open source uh, RTXCs. Uh, uh, it has a real heap implementation inside, so the, the blocks are forward and backward coalesced and so on. And the nice thing is, it has actually named task insights, and when you see the task names, you understand it a lot better. So, this here is from the uh, reversed firmware, the list of tasks that exist on the device, and you can directly see we have a power manager, we have the radio interface that has something to do with the Bluetooth. We have the ID bus, which is apparently the hit bus that is used for um, like the communication with the device over the USB. Uh, we have force, which is likely the pressure sensor on the top of the uh, of the um, pencil. We have inertia, which is the uh, accelerator, so it's the the angle and how you use it. You have a battery task. You have this IAP ID bus uh, task. This one is apparently used for passing this uh, closed source IAP protocol that Apple internally uses. Uh, we have a Bluetooth sync uh, um, task and we have something that's called FW deferred that apparently has something to do with firmware upgrades. Uh, yeah. So the next thing is, um, I already told you that when we look at these uh, um, daemon for upgrading, we can see that it talks, talks via hit uh, comments to the device. And when you connect an Apple Pencil to an iPad or in any other iOS device, because that works on any iOS device, when you, when you plug it in via the lightning port um, and check the I.O. kit registry for what new drivers were loaded and so on, you will see that there's this Apple Pencil now loaded and it offers four different hit devices. So these four hit devices have all different so-called primary usage. So when you talk to a hit device, you define what kind of usage you have and then you get different hit devices back. So uh, the great thing is when you dive down into the properties of these drivers, you will also see a bunch of report descriptors. These report descriptors are super long binary numbers or hex numbers, and you have no idea what they mean because they are identifiers. We don't really care about them, except for, for the fact that um, um, we can see marked in red the primary use for this specific uh, device. So we have uh, 11, 14, 17, and 18. So these are four different uses that you can have when you talk to the pencil. Um, the nice thing is these crazy looking report descriptors, you can just binary search them in the firmware and you will find this table here. And in this table, you can see that there are um, referenced by another table, and from that we know the internal number that is used for the specific device. So uh, here is I have uh, decoded this a little bit. We can basically, by cross-checking these two tables, we can see that primary usage 11 is internally called 240 and is associated with the main part of the hit device. Uh, 14 is 243, which has to do with inertia, so that was the accelerator sensor. Uh, and then 248 is force, and 245 is radio. So each of these now offer uh, hit features to the, the uh, to the iPad. This means on the on the iPad you can run code that talks to each of these separately. Uh, the nice thing is once you have figured out these numbers, you can find. Uh, the place in the code where they're actually set uh, callbacks to handle these uh, feature reports. And here's one example where you can see in the inertia main uh, code, um, they are setting a callback for four, 243, which was the inertia device, and you can see it gives a, a get function and a set function. Uh, 
So the idea here is when you send with an USB hit device comment, which is a get feature report, it will go through the first parser. And when it's a set feature report, it goes to the second parser. This is really great because you can now do this for I don't know how this happened. You can do this for all of them. And um, yeah, and then you get all the parsers that are involved in hit parsing. Okay, so let's see how this really works. So how does the firmware upgrade protocol work? So this is a lot of code, but it basically just shows you how you can connect to a driver, to a hit device driver on an iOS device that has a specific primary usage, in this case 11, and a product ID, which is 268 in this case, which is the um, keyboard, the 12.9 keyboard. The nice thing is, and this is something that maybe Apple does not even realize, um, this works even inside a sandboxed iOS process. So any app on your device can talk to your accessories. Uh, then the next step of this upgrade protocol is that it sends a get feature report B8 to the device and gets a return buffer. Uh, the return buffer has different content depending on the protocol that is used. And the WBS is basically the write buffer size, so it knows uh, how big uh, the device can be written to. And um, for example, the uh, keyboard uses protocol 1 and the pencil uses protocol 3. And the difference is that uh, with protocol 3, you have more configuration, like if you want an extended setup or if you want to have, uh, um, uh, if you want to send offsets or not, you can see this, uh, whatever the device needs from the flags. Okay, so as I said, there's this feature with protocol 3 that you can have extended setup. Uh, if this is required, um, the next step is sending a set feature report B0 with this certain magic C3BC code to the device. And this initialized firmware uploading. The next step is to tell it, now we want to upload a single firmware. So we have to send B0 with the magic code 6272 and then the device waits for a firmware upload. The next thing is then we have to upload the firmware piece by piece by sending hit requests with B1. So here it depends on the protocol uh, how this works because some devices like the keyboard require you to give the data offset in the beginning. So the first three bytes are used as a data offset where this is actually written into the firmware buffer. And this data offset is big endian, but only three bytes. Um, yeah, and after these three bytes, you will see the data. And of course, there's a lot of these requests need to be done to, to send actually 183,000 bytes because, because the write buffers are like 55 bytes. So you have a lot of these requests. So um, once you've uploaded everything, you need to commit to this firmware by sending a B2 report with the code zero. This will then tell the device, you have now a whole uh, firmware, please check it. Then the device will do all kinds of checks, like the RSA check and everything. And uh, when you now ask with a get report of the status, by asking get feature report B2 for the status, you should get an A1 hex back 
everything else means there was a problem with the firmware. And when you look into the white paper, you will see a large list of all the different error codes. Uh, like, for example, the RSA signature is missing, the, the signature is wrong, the digest is wrong, the CRC mismatches, and all these kind of things. Or, for example, the firmware version is wrong, you're trying to downgrade. So, the thing is now, on the pencil, you now have to fully commit all uploaded firmwares by sending a B2 with the C3BC code, and then for the pencil you have finished firmware uploading. For the keyboard you don't need this. Um, yeah, and the last step is then that you send a reset to the device, and then basically the device will reboot by sending a B3 uh, hit comment. Uh, I will now demo this on a um, on an actual pencil. And uh, the interesting thing here is that Apple forgot to have a downgrade check inside the pencil. Normally, Apple, this is like a, a, a sticky requirement for all their accessories. Everybody who creates an accessory for, for iOS devices, they are never allowed to ever, ever, ever allow downgrades because then you can upload an old firmware and exploit a vulnerability in old firmware. So Apple absolutely forbids this, but in their own product, they, they forgot it. So now let me see if this works. I'm taking the iPad here. I start screen mirroring. And now let me see if I can move this over. So this is now my iPad. Oops. Um, let's go into the uh, settings. This here runs, by the, uh, by the way, 11.3, so it's not the very, very latest one, but the same thing works on the latest one. So I don't want to pair the Bluetooth stick. I don't need it at the moment. So I go to the About, and I can see there's the Apple Pencil. So for some reason, this whole thing is not really fully stable. I mean, I mean iOS itself. So sometimes you see multiple pencils like here, but it's actually the same pencil. And when you look into it, uh, you can see it's the firmware 2.48. So that's the current firmware. So now let's kill this. And we just run this AFU downgrade. So this is nothing. It's just a white screen once it pops up. So, and this now takes about one minute and then it will terminate the app. And if everything worked, we should then have a downgraded pencil. Again, this is something that should never be possible because then you can upload an older firmware with a known vulnerability, exploit it and take over the pencil. Yeah, as I said, it takes one minute, and uh, unfortunately, my iOS skills are not so good that I can show you a progress bar. Um, so that's why it's a little bit boring. So this does not work against the keyboard, because the keyboard actually is a well-behaving accessory and will never, ever, ever allow to upgrade to a lower firmware. Yes, the minute should be over soon. Yeah, so it died. So now um, the best thing, course of action for me is to like pull this out so that it's reset it. So I keep it here so I'm not doing a magic trick and like replacing it. And now pull it back in, uh, push it back in. And I start the um, the settings. It asks me again if I want to pair, but no, I don't want to. I go to About, I go to the Pencil, and now we can say we have 2.4.0. So before it was 2.4.8, now it's 2.4.0, uh, which is a firmware that was like uh, a, a year older. So I just pulled it out again because, um, as I said, there will be silent upgrades 
And if you just leave it plugged in and you're connected to Wi-Fi, it will silently upgrade it to the newest firmware again. Uh, I don't know why it's required to have a Wi-Fi connection because uh, you don't need internet. You just need activated Wi-Fi. So even if you have no internet connection and only Wi-Fi activated, it will upgrade. If you disable Wi-Fi, it will not upgrade the state. If you're an attacker, you would now have to downgrade it, maybe no ex vulnerability exploited, and then you can give it back. Uh, the nice thing is when you do these attacks, you actually don't need to run around with a keyboard all the time, uh, with, with an iPad all the time, because you can just stick an iPad, uh, an Apple Pencil, you can just stick it into an iPod. You cannot draw on it but you can still do all this uh, communication via lightning with the pencil and uh, enjoy whatever exploit you might have. Uh, the other great thing is the iPod actually cannot upgrade your stick because it doesn't have the right plug-in for it. So, um, yeah, let's go back to the slides. So we've now seen we can download the firmware on the pencil and maybe exploit it. Now let's switch over to the smart keyboard. And there's something interesting about the smart keyboard because it uses SPI storage. Uh, what I mean by this is when you upload the firmware with these B1 set feature reports um, and give it the offset where it should write it, it actually not writing it into host memory. It's actually writing this over SPI to a specific memory offset of this SPI memory. Uh, it forces that all writes are going to this 20000 and 3BB000. Uh, everything inside can be written. Everything outside cannot be written. Um, when you upload a firmware, it is not necessarily like the main system firmware. It can also be other smaller types of firmware, like, for example, D0 or C0. Uh, there's no official name for, for them. Um, the first one, the D0, is some configuration block that gives your device the serial number. And D3B is something else. That has, is, I think it's called something with keys, but there's only a 32-bit value in there that is strange. So, um, okay. So this means we can only write to this area, but there's area outside of it, and our stuff that we write might be copied around. So the great thing is that the keyboard has a hit feature report, B6, that can be used for retrieval of the whole SPI memory. So you can read everything that was flashed and or written to this SPI, you can read it back. And this works by uh, setting the offset by doing a set feature report. And then you can read from this offset by using a get feature report B6. And then you can read arbitrary in this big block. Uh, the storage seems to be non-volatile. Uh, so even if you disconnect the, co the keyboard for uh, several days and put it back, the storage is still there. And whatever was previously written can be read back. The only attention here is that in the newest, in the small keyboard, in the 10.5, this feature does not work. Uh, but Apple did not fully remove it. Instead, they seem to have broken it and now the return value seems to be unicellized data from the memory of the um, yeah of the memory of the device. So you get some unicellized unknown data from the device, like memory content. So another little vulnerability. So when we read this back, I told you there's this configuration block at IE000. And when you read this from a keyboard, you will get this block here back. And inside this block, you can see the serial number of this device. Every device has two serial numbers. And uh, you can see the firmware version that it runs. You can see the vendor ID. 
uh, not the firmware version. You can see the uh, product ID, you can see the vendor ID, and you can see the hardware revision, which is one, the hardware revision, 5AC is the uh, Apple vendor, and 26A is the 10.5 keyboard. Uh, no, it's actually the 9.7 keyboard. Um, because on the 10.5, this wouldn't work. So, when I did this, I got like a crazy idea because I was like, okay, I can read back whatever was flashed. So why not buy a new keyboard and read what's there? My idea was that Apple likely will upload the firmware in the same way. And then the idea is oh, I can maybe read the firmware out. Uh, so I did this. I uploaded it and read it. And the result is that, unfortunately, Apple seems to first flash the firmware and then they upload the info block and so on. So what we see here is that the first four kilobytes here is the, are destroyed. It's the info blocks with a lot of FFFFF. And then after one kilobyte, we see something that looks like code. Turns out all the rest of the firmware is still there. So the question is now, can we reconstruct the actual firmware that's on the device with this information? So we can do this on the 12.9, we can do it on the 9.7. And uh, those are the newest versions that they have. But the problem is the only thing we can use for repairing is this 850. Because it's the only thing that Apple gives out. So when we compare the 850 to the 855 for 12.9, um, we can see that the end of the firmware that we can actually dump looks very similar. So we assume, why are the first four kilobytes not also completely similar? Um, so we just copy the old four kilobyte into the destroyed block. The next thing is, we know that the beginning is always an AFU header, and the AFU header is well uh, defined, so we can any time create a valid AFU header. Now, when we've done that, we have to reconstruct the green stuff. So, the green stuff, we just assume, should be very, very similar to um, the old stuff because everything here also looks very much byte identical. So, we assume everything in the beginning is byte identical, except for a few things that have to change, like there's a version number in the green, so we need to fix that. There are two uh, label relative addresses inside the green, so we have to actually figure the new relative addresses also. Then there's a few pointer inside the green that point into the blue, so we have to fix that also. We also have some relative jump from green into blue area, but we can find that and just change the target address by figuring out what the real target is. This is very easy because firmwares don't change so much. Uh, the last thing that we should have checked is if there's a pointer to SRAM in, in, in green that has changed because the rest of the structure has changed. Luckily, that's not the case. So uh, this seems to be a lot of uh, wishful thinking and working, but what I got out of this is I was actually able to make this firmware that I extracted pass all the checks, which means I have a byte-for-byte -byte copy of what Apple actually uses as firmware, because even the RS8 uh, is valid. Uh, this means I have this binary and uh, I can now theoretically take my 12.9 keyboard that is old and just upgrade it to this firmware version 2. Also, Apple does not provide a firmware upgrade. So, 
With the other keyboard, it's not that simple. The other keyboard, when you do this comparison is, you will see that there is a shift in it. You will see that after the four kilobyte, the code is the same, but it's all shifted around by 16 bytes. So something must have changed in the first four kilobyte so that the first four kilobyte became longer. So when you do this, and I had at this point, I already had, uh, like, I just did the other one, so I was already experienced in it. I was able to really easily pinpoint where these 16 bytes are that were changed. It is basically a new function that is called from the blue area with a backward call. And this red area is a 16-byte function. We have no idea what it is. So we can never ever reconstruct it. So we can never ever actually make this thing work. However, the only thing we need for research is we need a firmware that when we read into IDA or whatever, we have some working code. And for working code, we don't care about the 16-byte function. So this is more complicated than the previous step because we have still the version number in green that we can fix. That's easy. We have still the label relative pointers in green to somewhere in blue that we need to fix. But the problem is now we have a bunch of SRAM addresses, like even the initial stack pointer that is inside green that has changed. Luckily, from looking at changes later on, we can figure out where that is. And uh, we have now pointers to blue from either green or yellow that need to be fixed. We have relative jumps from green to blue, so we have to fix that again. We have now to fix also jumps from blue to green because the delta changed, so the opcode needs to be changed. Uh, we have to also figure out yellow to green jumps because there's also a change in the delta. So uh, all these opcodes change. So in the end, I have a firmware for the 9.7 that loads into either all the code perfectly disassembles, every, the code flow is great. Just this red area, the 16 byte in the middle, I don't have. And that's why I cannot make this pass. And that's why I cannot flash it to an actual device. But if Apple ever releases the next update, I will know what the 16 bytes are. And then I can reconstruct the old version. So um, the next and nearly last thing is... Um, the Apple Pencil crash lock. Because the Apple Pencil actually has a debugging tool inside the crash lock. And when the Apple Pencil crashes, throws a panic, then the crash lock is written to this flash area. And this might be helpful if you ever write an exploit against this uh, for code execution. Um, you can access this crash lock via the same hit features. This time we use report E1. And the idea is, by setting this feature, you can have three subfunctions. You can either erase the crash lock content, then uh, it's made empty. You can create a test crash lock, so it's a test crash, so you can see it works. And by using the 05, you can set the crash lock read offset because the crash lock is like, I think, 1024 bytes long. So, so you cannot read this at once. So you have to walk around in the offset. For some unknown reason, uh, here, the offsets are two bytes and little endian. Everywhere else, offsets are three bytes and big endian. So uh, when you have a get report, get feature report, you actually read back from this read offset and then this offset is automatically increased every time you read. Uh, I have a dump here that looks like this. 
So this is the output that you can see from this from this test crash. So you can see the file name, you can see all the processes that are currently running, you can see how much of the stack they used, you can see the active process when the crash happened, and you see some backtrace on the stack and the firmware version in the very end. So this might be quite nice. Also, depending on what kind of crash it is, other crashes can theoretically also give you register dumps, but not this one. Um, let me just show you this. I don't know if it's sleeping. Okay, so I have now sticked the Apple Pencil to the iPod. Uh, keep in mind, I said it still works. And now I have a tool called um, Toolbox Toolkit Crash Log. When we run it, we can see this is now the dump. The same one that is on the, on the thing. Uh, we can also see this here is the hexed version of this dump. So uh, this tool also has a few other features. Uh, I will give you the source code for all of this. There's serial. Serial will output the serial numbers of the device of the pencil. Um, I can say erase. This will clean. Uh, sorry, it's not erase. It's clean. I can clean it's clear <laughs> uh, yeah it's clear so uh, so this this now uh, cleared the, the the crash log so when we now dump the crash log we will see it's all zero there's nothing in the in the crash log and now we can use the um, the test so when we test this, it takes a while, and after it tested it, it's usually a good idea to unplug and plug in again. And now we can do this again, and we have the crash dump again. And because it's the auto-generated, it always seems it's the same, because it's always the test crash. I have actually never, except for one time I saw a mem fault, um, but usually the pencil does not crash. Uh, I have also another tool called Brute Force. When you run this, it will try out every single hit report. And um, this year is for primary usage 11. So you can see here are the serial numbers. Uh, but you can also give it a different primary then you get the different output because you're talking to a different part of the device and so on. There's 17 and so on. You go. So this is the thing is, for some reason, when you do this for the 17, the device becomes really slow after this and now everything takes forever. Um, let me just pull this out. Then everything is fine again. Uh, in theory, you can also um, say set then it does a set report and sending random data. And when I now read it back, you can actually see I get far more back and I'm actually not sure what this is because I just coded this tool like 10 minutes before the talk. So I don't know why suddenly this comes out. Um, yeah, I had a different version, but I never actually tried to fuss it this way. So I don't know if I, I uh, disturbed the device at this point or the driver or what, why is suddenly I get so much other things back. But again, I give you all the source code so you can play around with this. So let me just get back to the slides for the conclusion. Oops. So the result and the conclusion. Um, so... One of the most important things for me was, can someone just upgrade the firmware and take over my system? Uh, so I figured, I, I, I realized it's RSA 2048. I looked at the code. Uh, it seems to be good 
and well implemented, and I don't think uh, there's a vulnerability in there. Uh, also good is that the smart keyboard is actually protected against downgrades. Bad, of course, is that the pencil does not protect against this, but one I bet in a few days this changes. Um, the also bad thing is that you can read back the, uh, the old firmware. That's maybe not a good idea that you can just dump the firmware. And the other thing is I want to really know what is inside the bootloader because uh, if the bootloader doesn't have an additional sig a signature check, this would mean a one-time code execution is uh, forever taking over the device because then you can just bypass the signature check. So I really want to know if the bootloader has a check too, so I have to find this. Um, the other security architecture con is that we did not see any exploit mitigation anyway. There is no randomization, there are no canaries, there's no non-executable bits. And maybe this isn't even possible because the MPU does not exist in these devices. Also a security problem is why can sandboxed iOS application talk to these devices and even downgrade the firmware? Uh, this should never be possible even because Apple even wants people to not touch serial numbers so you can just read the serial numbers. Or you can just store some data in the SPI of the, of the, of the keyboard and then uh, keep the data there. Also, why is the firmware update daemon not sandbox? It talks to the device and reads data from the device, and I believe at least at one older version, the device could give it an illegal write buffer, and this would heap overflow. In the current version, that is no longer the case, but I saw an older version where it looks like it could work. Uh, so final conclusion is, uh, I only found smaller problems, nothing like uh, direct code execution. So for now, I trust these devices. Uh, but I've only looked at the part. I've mostly looked at the firmware verification and the hit stuff. I have not looked into Bluetooth on the pencil and the parsing of this proprietary MFI AIP protocol uh, because that's super strange. Um, I also have not done hardware attacks yet. I will uh, talk to Dimitri to do this. And one thing I want to do is I want to uh, change QEMU, the, the STM port, so that we can run the firmware in a QEMU. So, and this is it. Uh, I ran over time, um, but uh, you can ask me questions later, and uh, unless you have a very fast, short question. One. Uh, Yunchen? Um, for, for the firmware reconstruction, you said you made the RSA check pass. Uh, yes. There was a key created by you, I assume. No, 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 no. What I mean by this is uh, I repaired the firmware so much that it passes the normal check. You see, but you, you said the, the, um, the signature matched as well, so you, you yes. put a, your own... Yes, I, I, I was able to fully reconstruct the first four kilobytes, and of course I was a bit lucky, I made all the right guesses, but I was able to, this firmware can just be uploaded to, uh, to it, yeah. Uh, the, but, but if, if the content changed, the, the signature should change as well, I assume. The, no, so the problem is it's a real firmware but I lose the first four kilobytes. So my task is to find the first four kilobyte, which is theoretically impossible. But uh, because it's so near to an older version, I was able to fully reconstruct the first four kilobyte. Okay, thank you. The signature's at the end. It's, with, it's on the device, not only in the file. So it's no, the, 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 the signature is on the file, uh, at the end of the file. So the signature was not destroyed. It was only the first four kilobytes of the code and the header that were destroyed. Okay, thanks. Now I got it. Thank you. Yeah. It is not the task to like give it a fake firmware. It's just like to repair the old one to be able to analyze it. All right. Um, and any further questions? Probably off stage. Thank you very much, Stefan. Very interesting talk to wrap up the talks in this track for day one. Thank you again. <laughs>